I had some very wrong ideas about God as a child. I felt in a way that he was out to get us, especially if we didn't do what we were supposed to do. I felt that his plans for punishing us were much more vivid than his love for us. And because I saw him this way, it follows that I didn't really love him. How could I? As Christians, we're not tied to the superstitions that are so popular. Friday the 13th is supposed to bring bad luck. So is walking under a ladder, breaking a mirror, or having a black cat cross your path. All absolutely ridiculous. We try to bring good luck by crossing our fingers, carrying lucky charms, making wishes on wishbones, knocking on wood. All equally ridiculous. There are superstitions in religion, just as there are in life. It's hard to believe, but if the word holy is printed on the cover of a Bible, as in Holy Bible, it will sell much better than if the cover just says Bible. Have you ever heard that if a Bible is dropped, it's no good? A horrible idea, which leads us to think that somehow magic is involved. Some religions, like their church services, spoken in Latin. It's not that they understand Latin, it's just that they like the sound of it, almost like magic. The idea that God wants what is best for us was a foreign idea to me, but one of the nicest possible surprises along my life's journey. As a child, I thought he was trying to catch us doing what we shouldn't. I thought he was trying to restrict our fun, not allowing us to get away with anything and not allowing us freedom. These are really poisonous ideas. To think that God was in the business of spoiling our fun, when the fact is that it is these false ideas which spoil our relationship with God and with Jesus. You can imagine that the idea of being with Jesus was not something that I wanted to do. Listen to how very, very wrong I was about God's character. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, they are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. Another translation puts it even more vividly. God says, I alone know the plans I have for you, plans to bring about the future you hope for. This is really something to think about. Our Father wants to bring about the very future that we hope for. This verse reveals God's perfect love for us. In other words, God is on our side. He wants to bless us. He wants what is best for us. He wants us to be happy and successful. This is the very opposite of that false picture that I had of him as a child. Now, however, getting to be with God's son, Jesus, and eventually with God himself is what I most want to do. I mention these things to show you how important it is to have the right images in our minds and to know the truth about God and his son. I see now that what I thought were spoilers of fun were in fact safety guardrails to help us even to save our lives, but certainly not to trip us up. They were there to guide us, to show us the way to happiness. I'm not the only one who has false ideas about God. Some religions teach that unless you have followed God's rules, you will burn in hell forever. This is a cruel and dreadful thing to be said about the one who created us. Other religions teach that God is not fair, that he chooses who he will bless and chooses not to bless others just on a whim, just because he feels like it. You will see how terrible this idea is when you hear that those who are not chosen cannot do anything to change that position. In that false system, they cannot plead or be sorry or do anything at all to become a friend of God. I've heard it described like a game of musical chairs. When the music stops, you find a chair. Under the seat is a piece of paper that says, either chosen or not chosen. There is nothing whatsoever you can do about it. God has a plan for us and it's not heaven. There's a wonderful verse that will act as a guardrail for us. It will protect you from believing false things, even though those false ideas are held by many people. The heavens belong to the Lord, 
but he has given the earth to all humanity. So tuck that one in your memory bank. If you believe that the only way you can be happy, if you think that happiness is doing what you want to do, that is as wrong as those silly superstitions I mentioned. It's a recipe for a selfish and miserable life. God's plan is vastly much better. So who is this God of the Bible? One way we could describe him is as a deal-making, contract-writing, contract-honoring God. Abraham was the first one who God chose to make a contract with. God basically said that if Abraham would do so and so, he, God, would do such and such. God would do his promised part if Abraham and his family would do theirs. Just a quick reminder as to what the contract or agreement or covenant between God and Abraham was. God said, I'm going to give all this land to you and your offspring as a permanent possession. And I'm going to give you so many descendants that like dust, they cannot be counted. Abraham's part was to obey. And as we know, his first test of obedience was to move to a place he had never seen. Success is a topic of much interest to people today. Very often they mean by it doing well financially and being wealthy. But this is not what success means in scripture. The word comes from succession, which means being in line to inherit a promise or property. It means that because of the death of one person, the transfer of something goes to the next person in line. And I would like to teach you a new and related word. It is successor. And so we have the three related words, success, succession, and successor. It means someone to carry on the work, someone to receive the promises, someone to continue the contract with God. So what does that mean to us? Well, Abraham is dead and he did not inherit what God promised. Does that mean that Abraham failed or that God was not true to his promise? Of course not. You might ask the awkward question, what good is a promise if you can't live long enough to collect on it? No problem. God has an answer for that. The promise is still good. The contract is still valid. It becomes a contract between God and Abraham's descendants or relatives or the next in line. In the Bible, there is never a success without a successor to continue the contract. Without tracing every relative of Abraham in all the generations since, the Bible does this for us, we find that Jesus is the final successor to the contract. And Jesus is so hugely generous in that he has said, whatever he gets, we get. Success in the Bible does not mean immediate or short-term inheritance. It's a long-term view so as to include all who choose to join. This God of the Bible, this God of ours, has a brilliant plan for the earth and he invites all who want to, to come and be a part of it. To begin with, he plans to make animals harmless, both to us and to each other. You should let your imaginations have free reign to picture this and all that it would change. This God of ours is planning to do away with sickness and pain. Not only that, but he will heal the blind, the deaf, and the lame. Those are all conditions that cause grief, and therefore grief and crying will be done away with as well. The creator of all that is, is planning to restore all things to their prime, brand new condition. Deserts will blossom like a rose and the earth will become a paradise. Crops will not have pests and diseases and will produce wonderful health-giving food. We've seen the enormous generosity of Jesus in sharing his inheritance with us. His father wants to bless us unbelievably, out of all proportion to what we deserve. He says this, by my great power, I have made the earth and all its people and every animal. I can give these things of mine to anyone I choose. I pray that we will be wise in our choices.